In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicast. Cast, the official podcast of Bundablog.com, the home of light tubes this week. <laughs> yeah. I am your strong and you know never scared host, Stephen. <laughs> and with me today is the they of theys. Our hardcore non-binary champion, D Rock. Let's do this. I'm, I'm stoked for some some hardcore action. Let's do it. So, uh, D Rock was noticing that there hasn't been a lot of coverage of number one Twitter Twitter trending GCW Homecoming. Right, yeah. And this is a matchup that I got excited for um, when I was watching uh, Matt Cardona's YouTube videos. And he he posted a video on how he entered into the GCW universe. um, Where he dressed up like a druid and everyone thought it was going to be teasing John Moxley versus Nick Gage because of the dark side of the wrestling episode and it turned out that it was Matt Cardona um making his death match debut aka Zack Ryder aka Zack Ryder for the uninitiated um and with the pay-per-view being available for a measly 13 to 20 dollars on the fight tv app it was a a no-brainer purchase to see some crazy deathmatch wrestling yeah for sure i was I, i and i um i i was kind of impressed in a way by the fact that they sort of split up both nights so you could like buy you could buy one by itself or you could buy like the weekend package for a little bit cheaper and i didn't realize how smart that was until night one was over and i realized i really wanted to see night two and they got an extra like five bucks out of me because of that five or six bucks well um i didn't catch all of of night two so i'll let i'll let dare d rock talk about that stuff but uh let's go through the card in chronological order yeah i got it. that's how i got it here in my notes so yeah we uh we got uh the lead off match which i thought was really smart in a way it was marco stunt versus starboy charlie starboy charlie Starboy charlie was was a lot of fun um this was cool like i i thought it was kind of smart you know they I felt like kind of throughout the whole weekend, they seemed very cognizant of the fact that there were a lot of new eyes on on their product. And this is one of those one of those things that they did was kind of, you know, they they opened up with a sort of an AEW fan favorite in Marco Stunt and gave him more ring time than i think we've seen combined from him in all of aew 
which is really cool. Yeah, and the he's apparently a GCW um, fan favorite too, and and the audience was really just in love with with Marco. And it's one of the rare matchups where you see Marco taking on someone of you know relatively his height and weight. Right. Um, so that made it a really you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, There's a lot of parody in the matchup. Yeah, definitely. And just like, you know, not just the fact of opening with Marco Stunt as a recognizable figure and opening with him, you know, actually facing somebody who's of comparable size and strength, but also it was like just a really super fun, exciting match, which was also a really good way to start. Well, also should be noted, since we're here at the beginning, and that's where things are noted, is that the this is in the showboat in atlantic city this is a, a prime venue there's over 1500 people there just packed house there's like this beautiful multicolored paneling on the roof oh yeah there's, there's this very like uh i don't know very just homey feel mm. to the whole <laughs> environment it's very kind of like seventies architecture. Yeah. I feel like, which is very yeah, it's very like comforty. There's something cozy about it. There's like two chandeliers above the action to give it like that touch of class. But you're in Atlantic City, so you know that this is all very also unclassy. Um, it was it was really nice. Um right, yeah. Marco Stunt has a hell of a it's match. Like, uh, Oh, go ahead. Marco Sun has a hell of a match. He ends up getting over and getting a big win mm -hmm. over Starboy Charlie. And the crowd goes well. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I was a little bit concerned about how red Marco Stunt was during this match. I don't know what's going on with his... Uh, incredible redness but he was like redder than brock lesnar wrestling more than 10 minutes it was a little scary but a great match a lot of fun Super everything great. everything i know about gcw i know from that dark side of the wrestling about nick gage oh yeah so i was like shocked that there wasn't like light tubes and barbed wire in this match like that threw me off i was like whoa they're having an actual wrestling match wow oh my god they're really trying yeah that, I, I think that was one of the things that impressed both of us throughout the weekend and we'll probably talk more about it later but there was a lot of like variety on this show they had a little bit of something for everybody which is kind of how a good indie show should be and i was uh, that was one of the things that really like drew me in and you know kind of made a fan out of me now i saw some tweets ranking this Starboy charlie versus Marco Stun as the second best match of the night. Really? Um, I wouldn't quite put it so so high up there because, you know, I, I got to give a little more extra love to the people who shed some blood. But I thought it was a hell of a match. I thought it was a great match. It was a hell of a match. I also wouldn't necessarily rank it that high in terms of, matches that night because there are a couple more that we'll get to in a little bit that i i really enjoyed a lot and the storytelling of the main event was really well done but yeah definitely a really good match i definitely enjoyed it a lot and so moving on to the second match was tony deppen versus ninja mac who is super cool. I love Ninja Mac. He's a totally like insane, flippy, high flyer. And I also really like, they had a couple of matches like this where it was sort of a, a clash of styles because Ninja Mac is like a really crazy flippy guy and Tony Deppen's like a very technical wrestler. And they kind of got to clash styles really well. The thing I think is really cool about Ninja Mac is he's like a flippy guy, but he's like pretty thick. You know what I mean? He's not like your typical like little flippy guy, you know, thin flippy guy. He's like 
got a good like bit of chunk on him that really gives him a lot of impact when he finally lands something. Yeah, for sure. And for a guy like he's 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 like another level of flippy guy. He does the kind of like, you know, Will Ospreay shit that like not a lot of guys can really do, even the flippy guys. And I also like he has a really great look. He has a great entrance. It was a lot of fun with the crowd like, you know, chanting ninja, ninja and all that stuff. So I liked him a lot. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more of him at some point. Yeah, this match had uh I'm looking at it now on my phone as we're talking about it. And it had some like some really cool spots. There were a couple of like little not so perfect um flips and stuff like that, but overall like if I saw that match live and paid to see it live, I think I'd be thoroughly very much impressed. And already, like, I was like, wow, on GCW. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two matches. For sure. So... For sure, yeah. they, 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 they had, like, four different styles of matches before they even got to anything hardcore, which I think was also really smart. Like, show people, because everyone... Everyone who who is unfamiliar with GCW is kind of coming in thinking, oh, this is, you know, deathmatch. So everything's going to be hardcore. It's going to be barbed wire. And, like, every match you're going to be hitting each other with chairs and going through tables. But they, there was none of that until the, the uh, ultraviolet title match. And it was awesome. They yeah. had, like, this uh, this one spot that um tony deppins like slapping ninja mac over and over in the face um and i really like tony deppins like psychology uh overall in the match i think that you know i'd i'd like to see him in AEW and in impact and in other promotions i think he's a really fantastic wrestler yeah for sure yeah i'd love to see ninja mac too because he was he was very impressive I saw some highlights actually of Brian of him fighting Brian Cage. Oh wow. Brian Cage's Instagram at some indie shows. So that was pretty cool. Nice. Very cool. So next up we have what I actually felt was at least from a wrestling, pure wrestling standpoint, to me, this was the match of night one and maybe the whole weekend was AJ Gray versus Nolan Edward. Um, first of all, both guys have really cool looks. Uh, AJ Gray is this big bruiser guy who has a really cool, like, hip-hop entrance. And then you have Nolan Edward with his, like, cane slash mankind hybrid mask thing that he apparently usually takes off before the beginning of the match and people were pointing out that he actually was wearing it during this match which was great because it led to one of the coolest moments of the match i don't know if you remember this where he where he He fired up and he took it off threw it down yeah that was a lot of fun um yeah I, i just in general i felt like nolan especially had a really great like sense of drama and psychology and aj did too but nolan edward especially i felt like he really like there were some really cool moments where he like you know popped the crowd in a big way with some really dramatic moments the crowd was super hot for aj gray they came to party with him and see him whoop ass and I thought Nolan was a very interesting enigma of a character. Mm-hmm. Um, I immediately like wanted to see like a promo from him, and I wanted to understand right. what his voice was. So I think that they they've done an intriguing job at displaying these these you know these wrestling characters. And yeah. the crowd is so hot. I don't even know how they got this hot. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. It was like not that many people, but they were very, very, very hot, very loud. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the I think GCW did a really, again, they were definitely cognizant of the fact that there was a lot of new people watching and did a really good job of presenting all their wrestlers and their characters in a way that uh, kind of, you know, piques the interest of people who are watching for the first time. And I definitely am, am really wanting to see more of both of these guys, really. They were both they were both really excellent. The other interesting thing about Nolan was he had like not just his mask, but he has like this like big like butt flap. Oh yeah. <laughs> like not like Samoan wrestlers do where they have like a flap in the front and the back. Right. But he had like this like giant one with sort of like this like peace sign eye sort of weird symbol. So he was just very intriguing. He was He's very clearly like, you know, the type of wrestler that if he doesn't have a bunch of, like he found a way to make himself stand out is the nice way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. At least, yeah. And uh, found a way to, you know, make himself stand out before you actually see him wrestle as opposed to having to pull you in with his wrestling, which is also very good. Yeah. Um, Next up, was the match of the millennium match of the century two cold scorpio versus grim this match was seven stars in the tokyo dome hold on i think you gotta read uh, that line because the internet was like acting all crazy when you were announcing grim reefer Oh really? Yeah, let me get Yeah, up. this get was take. Okay. Uh everything? Uh just the yeah, the everything, yes. Yeah, so this is match of the year, match of the millennium, seven stars in the Tokyo Dome. Um just because it was just like this was this was so over with me and I'm sure with Steven as well just for the fact that Grim Reefer lit up a joint in the middle of the match and passed it to two cold Scorpio and Scorpio refused it at first, but then like, I think he was like about to do a pile driver and he like picked it up and lit it up and smoked it. And yeah, that was just, it was just, you know, I was high already. And so like that that just popped me so massively and uh you know other than that like it was it was it was still really good without all that stuff and it was really cool to see two gold scorpio who is a guy that i you know when i first started watching wrestling he was one of those guys that i was like oh this jobber you know and as I got a little bit older, started to realize, you know, how how good of a wrestler he was, how influential he was in the style that he did. I think he was one of the first guys to like do a five for a four fifty. He wow. he kind of pioneered that that flipping leg drop that he still can do. I was really impressed that he's like over fifty years old and he can still do the flipping leg drop, which is pretty cool. So. Uh, yeah, this is uh, four, 420 stars out of five. One of the greatest things about this pay-per-view was that they had, um, you know, some, some they could use whatever music they wanted for people's entry. <laughs> and Two Cold Scorpio came out to Jungle Boogie and danced with everyone to Jungle Boogie. He had the longest entrance because everyone had to have a great time with Two Cold Scorpio. Yeah, it was like so Undertaker down. length, Undertaker length of re- of re- entrance. Yeah, just partying to Jungle Boogie. I think they had to restart Jungle Boogie because they ran out of Jungle Boogie and needed more Jungle Boogie. Yeah. Um, and then finally, Two Cold Scorpio gets in the ring, and I was joking that like Two Cold Scorpio is worried about COVID. He's keeping this mask on. Yeah, yeah. The whole match. Um, and they had a great match for two older, probably the two oldest wrestlers on the card. 
I think uh, so, yeah. And they tore the house down. This this is sort of, I guess, the GCW version of a comedy match slash like a legends match. Right, right. A, a little bit of yeah, like and I you know, there's a little bit of comedy, there's a little bit of legends, there's a little bit of, you know, smoking weed. You know, there, there's, there's, you know, a, a nice little amalgam of gimmicks that you would see at a, at a, at an indie show where they can kind of do whatever they want. Um, yeah, just kind of co- coalesced into this really cool, really, really cool little, little spot. I loved it. Um, I was really impressed by Tim Storm, aka Grim Reefer, and he was doing Actually, some sick flips. Off I, the top I, rope. I have to make a correction on that. I don't. I I looked it up and that's it's not actually Tim Storm. Whoa! I I misunderstood somebody in the comment section of uh, in the chat in the chat for the for on Fight TV. Um. So I don't. I, I and I'm not. I'm not sure because I looked up Grim Reefer and he doesn't look that old. So he might not be after all. So I might have totally shit the bed with that that comment. Okay, well, Grim Reefer was doing some sick flips off the top rope, outside <laughs> of the ring. Good shit, yeah. And that was fucking dope, okay? For sure. Just like sure. the dope he was smoking. <laughs> and, and also the, 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 the part at the end where after Too Cold Scorpio, you know, hits his amazing leg drop and wins and then he revived grim reefer with his own reefer he lit up he like stuck the stuck the joint roach in his mouth and lit it up and he popped right up like the undertaker you know it was great it was amazing storytelling yeah totally and you know you said it there should be one of these matches on every gcw show yeah absolutely this is this is this is like so in my wheelhouse i would love to see uh I, I wish every I wish every wrestling card I ever watched had at least one marijuana related match, but that's just me. <laughs> now next up, this next match had like a little bit of a of a package in front of it. The uh oh yeah, the Drew Parker package. That's right. I forgot about yeah, he he had a whole story about how he came to G- Came to the states, I think it was, and came to GCW, and you know, I, I, I was, I, I don't think I, like, was paying close, att- close enough attention to the whole thing, but yeah, they had a whole sort of storytelling moment for him before the the uh, the Drew Parker versus Alex Colon for, and it was title versus title. It was Drew Parker's Big Japan Pro Wrestling Deathmatch title against Alex Colon's GCW Ultra Violent title. So this is a big, a big death match. And uh, I believe this is this is my first time watching a like legit quote unquote death match. I'm pretty sure it's also Steven's first time with this kind of match. Like we've watched like, you know, a death match, you know, Texas death match, something death. Well, we've seen like Terry Funk in death right. matches. I think that counts. But we've yeah. never seen the like modern like CZW, which is combat zone wrestling for those who don't know, who kind of pioneered this whole like light tubes and glass and all kinds of crazy super super violent things that we'll get to in a minute um we were both very anxious before this match uh in part because of the light tube dust that we were very afraid of people getting in their eyes and breathing in and and stuff like that um, which which they go on to call spooky dust. Spooky dust. <laughs> yes, very spooky when you have light particles in your body. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So this was an interesting experience. It was. It definitely made me feel things. 
not all things that I wanted to feel, but not necessarily things I didn't want to feel because obviously I watched the whole thing and it was, it's very, you know, there's a morbid sort of curiosity to like, this is so insane and disgusting, but I can't stop watching because it's, it's just so engaging. It's so compelling and visceral. Uh, it's hard not to watch. Alex Cologne is a madman. Yes. He was just like torn Big to threads. Um, Drew Parker, I initially like, I'm not really feeling this guy. He's got like weirdly colored shorts. He's got like scraggly mm. hair. He doesn't look like, you know, a very intimidating opponent. So I'm going to root for for Alex Cologne, I tell myself. The, the, one of the first things I noticed, and it's hard not to notice, uh, when the guys were getting into the ring, you look at their backs and you can see already what's going to happen in this match. Their backs are just covered in scars from getting cut up by glass and all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's already such a, like, shocking, compelling visual and really adds to this sort of portent of, you know, violence and, like, uncomfortable feelings. And they have, they start the match with a glass door in one corner, a pallet of light tubes in another corner, uh, uh, three or four light tubes in one corner, and then all, all along the ring ropes are light tubes. This is just a chamber of of unpleasantness. <laughs> a chamber of unpleasantness. That's the title of the episode. And freaking Real. Alex Cologne is grabbing light tubes and doing tope suicidas. Yeah, that was cool. Parker. That was really it's cool. Insane. I love the the sound of the light bulb smashing is so loud they like pop and I'm not sure but I was wondering if it's because they're like vacuum like sealed that they have they like pop when they when they explode and also they have those like 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 packs of like four or like six sometimes and taped together that, yeah, like when you hit someone with that, it's so friggin' loud. And especially when they went through that pallet, it was so loud. All the glass breaking too was like everything was like so loud. And and also they had the their their sort of like ring floor, uh the like canvas, I guess, uh is one of those that's not padded, I'm pretty sure. It sounded that way because that's how that's like what ECW had back in the day. They had it was just like you know wood basically with like a, a canvas over it, and there was no padding. And so like all the sounds of people hitting the mat are super loud, and they have that like and it's you know on springs, and they have that it's that impact with like the bam on the wood and then the j -j 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 of the of the springs and stuff so all the all the sounds of this match were really really visceral and really really good and the other thing is gcw doesn't have like guardrails yeah that's like fair. people are just sitting in the front row and they're just like a good like six feet you know eight feet from the actual ring and they, come up, they come up sometimes. That was one of the cool things about ha not having the guardrails. Um, the first time I saw it was it was the, the Nolan Edward match, that fire up. They come up to the ring apron and start banging on the ring apron. And it creates this really cool visual and audio sort of uh, moment. Yeah, it's a very interesting environment to have a match in. Um, and Alex Cologne with his bald head just like gets progressively more gory on the top of his head. 
So like his head in and of itself is just like emoting for the match. And ultimately he gets beaten. Um, and Drew Parker gets to walk away with two belts. Yeah. And and has to wrestle the next night, by the way. <laughs> the main event of the next show. Um the I think that if there was if there was one thing, it's not really even a complaint necessarily. It's just kind of I noticed that with the death matches, they go really, really far with like how much the the guys are able to kick out of. Um which I kind of like, the more I thought about it, I was kind of like, you know, it's a death match. These guys do this all the time. So they're kind of used to all the pain that they're going through. So it does kind of, and, and the fact that it's a death match, like the whole point of this is to show how tough you are. So of course, anybody that's going to do these kinds of, you know, death match things is going to like, kick out of everything short of getting shot in the face. So uh, I kind of justified it to myself that way. And that way it kind of makes sense. Um, And sorry, I didn't mean to, I see you. There was a moment where uh, Drew Parker, I don't remember exactly what he did, but Drew Parker hit like a really big move on Alex Cologne and Alex Cologne kicked out at one and the match, the drama of the match just took off from there. Like up until that point, it was a little bit, you know, spot. Just, it's a death match. Like you're they're they're, they're hitting all the death match spots and doing all the violent stuff, but that kick out at one just popped the crowd so big. And then it became like the, the drama was there and that really made the match for me. That's that's right. I remember that. That was dope. Um, I don't think that the the kickouts really even came into my mind. Yeah. In this match, because I was just so like blown away by the level of intensity and gore and just like the insanity of like you know glass light tubes getting shoved in people's foreheads and stuff like that abbing each other it, it's just very 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 intense and you know when you see like horror movies and stuff like that like that's an approximation of yeah what this is you know right. which except real you know like this is what it really looks like when someone is bloodied and stabbed and thrown through glass about you know, like as 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 bloody and stabbed as a person can be without like actually losing enough blood that their life is in danger. Yeah, this is this is about as much blood as you'll ever see, you know, in in a in a consensual situation, probably. Uh so yeah, it was it was quite an experience. And uh I would I would do it again for sure. I don't know that I would attend in person one of these one of these shows. That seems a little bit dangerous. But uh, and uh, this match was just you know just halfway through the first night. Yeah, right. And that was and and that was another really interesting thing is like right after this match they had a twenty minute intermission, which for for like a split second I was like, what the fuck are they having a? And then I realized, oh. They have to clean all this shit up before the next match, <laughs> which so yeah, that makes sense. Like yeah, they would have to they have to clean up all the blood and all the glass. And apparently, they just swept it under the ring. Though remember, we saw they don't have time to take it out of the building. They just gotta yeah. shove it under your under your under your bed, like your mom with your laundry in you know, your room. <laughs> yeah, it's true. This next match was the six-way scramble. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Um, and this was another fun, fun chance to highlight the different characters that GCW has and see how they play off each other in in this, you know, this six-way scramble match. Yeah, definitely. There was there was like a bunch of guys in this match that I really came away really liking and wanting to see more of. 
Um, I think my favorite was probably Shane Mercer, who's kind of the powerhouse of the uh, of the group, and he got to do some. You know, the the rest of the guys for the most part, I feel like were were mostly like high flyers, and he got to kind of play the uh, the spoiler of the the powerhouse guy and do some really cool power moves and stuff. But he had that one that one really great moment where. He, um, Atticus Kogar was another one of the guys that I really enjoyed and want to see more of. Um, how does this, his gimmick is apparently that he brings a handful of skewers to the ring and will stab them into somebody's face, um, as part of the, you know, hardcore, you know, stabbing stuff. And, Shane Mercer just like no sold it and just like fired up and and it 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 popped the crowd so huge it was a really really cool moment and then the announce team had the the great line about how he looked like a what was it a a jacked up foosball or a jacked up foosball foosball yeah it's the foosball reference yeah that was hilarious um, yeah Atticus is really cool he's got kind of like He's got a nose ring. He's got like a punk haircut. He's got like sideburns. He sort of, you know, he has like this very like cocky heelish thing going on. So he was a cool character. One of my favorite characters, I think his name was Dante Leon, right? Yes, Dante Leon. We both liked a lot. That he looks like sort of a grunge uh, hippie with, you know, multicolored hair. Um, who looks like he could have, you know, fit in with like the flock and Raven, you know, back in the day. Yeah, for he sure. Cool high flying moves. For sure. Yeah, he was really cool. He had a great look. He had a lot of fun moves and stuff. He actually had a match. So the all 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 four of the guys that I really liked, which was Shane and Dante, Atticus, and then there was also Jack Cartwheel was pretty impressive. Also, his name is Jack Cartwheel, which is cool. um, they all had matches the next night again, which was really cool. And um, Dante Leon was actually in a tag team with Ninja Mac, which made me very excited. I really hope that there that that's not just like a one off thing, because I definitely want to see more of the team of Dante Leon and Ninja Mac. Yeah, that's skipping ahead, but um, yeah, right, yeah. the six-way scramble was uh, a fun fight. I really thought, too, I was interested, like, they let all of these matches on this pay-per-view, like, really breathe and take their time sure. and get all their spots in. Like, this was a, for the 13 bucks I paid for this one night, this was a tremendous value already. Absolutely. Um, who who ended up winning? I forgot. Uh, I think it was Atticus that ended up winning. Yeah, he like stole a pin from somebody. I think. Okay. Which is which makes sense because he's kind of like he 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 seems like he's the guy in that match who had kind of the highest stature. You know, he's he's in four four zero. He's kind of Ricky Shane Page's like second in command, basically. Um, so it makes sense to give him that win. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this was a really cool, just like showcase of a bunch of guys with, uh, really cool looks, some different styles maybe. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was a really, another really good, you know, targeted thing for all the people who are tuning in for the first time. I think. Yeah. Good shit. The other thing that, you know, we haven't put over yet is, like, how fun the commentary team was. Yeah, they were. Because just have, they just have total freedom to just curse and, you know, act a fool. And, you know, you got one guy on commentary who's just like, hey, somebody tweet someone who's here to bring me beer because I want more beer. <laughs> and have someone bring me more beer. And, like, you know, just complaining. And... It's really fun, really fun atmosphere. 
Yeah, I like them a lot. I did feel like like sometimes they ventured a little too far from what their job is supposed to be, but it it, it was fun. You know, like it definitely it was different for sure to hear a couple of commentators that aren't you know uh, doing the the very regimented trying to keep the show on track kind of thing that commentators are supposed to do but they they did it really and they, they the 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 match where it added the most and we'll get to that later but it really added the most to the Matt Cardona match and the fact that they were just shitting on him the whole match was oh. really appropriate so what was next next up was the tag title match with the second gear crew consisting of Mance Warner and Matthew Justice versus G Raver and Jimmy Lloyd who are who were the defending champions going in and also hate each other so it was one of those deals where two rivals kind of happen into uh tag team titles and they kind of played it the way that you would expect with the 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 challengers sort of playing them against each other uh which kind of i think was was pretty much the finish was you know they made g raver think that jimmy lloyd hit him with a chair and then he he took him out and they just you know double teamed uh g raver g raver had an awesome entrance yeah not like this like satanic cloak with a pentagram He's got this giant mask with horns that just looks like it came out of a metal music video. Um, Jimmy Lloyd has a less um, impressive look. He just looks kind of like, you know, your crazy deathmatch, like your quintessential deathmatch wrestler. That's what Jimmy Lloyd looks like. He looks yeah, like, you know. He kind of looks like like an imp or like a dwarf sort of like he just has that like chin beard and like the long hair and he's very round and or like a hobbit maybe almost yeah and then the second gear crew they have a much more classical wrestling look they're bigger guys they're more muscular um they i really love uh mance warner like legit looks like a crazy dude like he has those eyes that pop out that are really, the, is he the bald one or the one with yeah, hair? Yeah, he's the one that the, there was a there was like a person in the crowd that had a cardboard cut out of his head where it was all bloody, and he like stood next to it like with his all eyes all wide like pointing to it. Um, he had a he had a really cool look. I liked him a lot, and the you know this is a this is a very violent match. Also, um, it wasn't really my favorite match but it wasn't really designed to be it was just kind of a solid match that was leading toward the you know playing g raver against jimmy lloyd thing there was that one spot that grossed both of us out where i think it was mance warner that got his tongue stapled to to the to the board Oh my god, yeah. And it looked like he got his tongue shredded. Like I thought I legit thought that he like permanently damaged his tongue. But apparently he was fine. I don't know, magic staples. I don't know how that works. I guess, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they only stapled like a little piece of his tongue so that it just like ripped a little bit. Well, the tongue does bleed a lot, you know, cuz it does. Because it's all veins, you know? It's just a big thing. Um, they had, like, a door in the match. Like, this is, like... These are things that I am not used to just seeing lying in a wrestling ring. An entire right. door, okay? With hinges on it, okay? Yeah. Just laying down but in the corner of the wing, ring. Tables are for pussies. We have doors. Yeah. Now. So... <laughs> Like, once, I don't know where, 
GCW is getting their props from, but apparently they got a discount on doors. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, there was doors. There's a lot of doors. There was a door with like glass paneling for for the Drew Parker Alex Cologne match that like didn't break right the first time they tried to use it, and then they had to like put Drew Parker. Drew Parker like his butt like went through the glass paneling and the, the like the actual door part didn't break. So I imagine that whatever glass was left over cut him up pretty bad too. They also had like a barbed wire door, a door where they put a bunch of barbed wire on. Yeah, that's right. And went through. There were some some sick chair shots that the second gear crew imparted to help win this match. That was one thing. There was a lot of unprotected chair shots in this on this show, which is not ideal. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's a way that they do that that's safer, but it sure didn't look very safe. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think that nothing that anyone is doing on the show is is very safe. No. Yeah. So I don't think that you know the the line is drawn there. Right. Totally. Uh, what was next after the second gear crew's big win? The next thing, I guess. I don't know if it was announced. I don't think it was, but uh, it was the Effie Effie with Ali. And came out and like confronted frontman Ja, and they had like a little short match. And oh my god, I love Effie. This is the that was so cool. That was another little, you know, indie show quirk kind of thing that you won't you you might not see, um, you know, on another show. But he, he was just like this really like kinky horny gay guy and he, and it wasn't you know like it was it, it 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 was it was tasteful enough like it seems like he's probably actually a gay guy in real real life not like uh you know a straight guy trying to like play gay and like be like vaguely offensive about it like he was just he seemed very much himself but, you know, himself being, you know, a crazy, weird, kinky gay guy. And it was really cool. Yeah, this was unexpected for for me. Um, but apparently, you know, Effie is a huge, um, a huge favorite in the GCW universe. Um, and this match with Frontman Jaw was pretty good. This was a great, you know, palate cleanser before the main event. Definitely. Um, and the finish was was so good. Um, the way they closed everything out with uh, Effie saying that he knows Frontman Ja is a pansexual soldier. Pansexual soldier, yeah. And that he can, you know, get down with that. And then they kiss. Mm-hmm. And then Allie Catch, the lovely Allie Catch, comes into the ring. And then she ends up kissing frontman Jaw as well. And apparently Allie Catch and Effie have a tag team called oh, no. Buffy that's, that's going to be performing at some upcoming GCW shows. So they're like a little mini faction of their own. Yeah, and he also, Effie also invited frontman Jaw to Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Right is happening in chicago on the day of all out which is they they kept on talking about the second city summit so i think there's going to be like a whole you know it's going to be kind of like kind of like what happens with wrestlemania where there's like like 10 different other indie shows that are happening in town that same weekend for for all the people who are in town so that's pretty cool yeah Um, never in a million years would i think watching a pay-per-view for a Nick Gage deathmatch wrestling, would I see two wrestlers inviting each other to a big gay brunch? <laughs> was, like, that blew my mind right there. I'm like, East I love GCW. W. This is great. GCW is all about the diversity, man. The the Like, even just, like, in the matches, like, there's so much diversity in this card 
Also, I have to bring up the my favorite moment of the the Effie frontman jaw match when Effie went and twisted frontman jaw's nipples, and frontman jaw was like, "I like that shit." Yes. That was and then fun. he twisted the other nipple and frontman jaw was like, I'm into that shit. And that was super great. That was hilarious. And now we got the main event. The main attraction. Yeah, this was, I mean, this was everything I expected, right? So, like, there had been, like, some great crowd entrances mm-hmm. at the start of this pay-per-view and throughout this pay-per-view and um the announcer who his twitter is at the emil j um i think his name is emil j he was doing a great job of announcing for gcw in like his own way but until you hear him announce for Nick Gage and for MDK, like you haven't really heard him announce yet. Cause it was just the best freaking like entrance yeah. announcing yeah. I've heard it. Yeah, the whole spiel, the MDK gang affiliated, the whole thing. Big Nate, rest in peace. Come yeah, right, right, right. But I will say this. My favorite, one of my favorite moments of the entire weekend was Emil announcing Matt Cardona in the following manner. This is Matt Cardona. (laughs) And then the crowd just white hot with booze. Yeah. And they were just so upset that Matt Cardona. Oh, it's a great moment for that. Okay. Uh, the other great moment for Matt Cardona's entrance was that he started with, oh, radio, tell me everything you know. I popped for that big time. The Zack Ryder music. But then he, he switched it up and had some like hardcore music. Yeah, he had his always ready entrance music um, that's custom to him that he uses in Impact and on all his shows. Um. And I think that really, like, what I think made this match so great, part of it was definitely the build to the match and Matt Cardona just trolling the GCW universe um, as he, much as he could on Twitter. He, 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 one of the ways that he was trolling them was by calling them the GCW universe. Yeah. As if they were the WWE universe. They hate that shit, too. You know, like, that's hilarious. Um, and, you know, they set up at the side of this ring for this match. They had a Detoff collector's case filled with, um, with action figures to take a bump through to sort of make it a little special for this match. Because they were, that was one of the things that, like, the, like, I I think GCW was, like, making fun of uh matt cardona because he like plays with action figures or something or he collects action figures and you know that's not hardcore or whatever i don't know but so that was kind of a a nod to that yeah and uh and i think matt cardona played it geniusly wearing all white yes um he had a special you know matt cardona shirt on with the long island with the fuck you um, for the GCW universe to watch. And then we got to watch that white shirt just turn full blood red yeah. by the end of the match. Yeah, it's like uh, it's it's like when you go see Guar live, you got to wear a white shirt because you're going to get sprayed with all kinds of like blood and piss and seam. Not real, obviously. It's just like colored water shot through a hose, but that's like their whole gimmick is they like come out and all these like big get ups and they like, you know, cut, cut people's heads off and blood squirts all over the crowd. And so, yeah, that was very smart. Um, It was, you know, I think this is a really a great match because we got to see, you know, Nick Gage 
doing what he came there to do. Like you see Nick Gage swinging light tubes at Matt Cardona with just full reckless abandon. And then you see Matt Cardona swinging back and you could see a story going on in like at first him sort of having this, not a hesitation, but sort of like this discomfort with how properly to swing this at another human. And then by the end of the match, he was, you know, swinging with the pros. Right. Like I would have thought like, you know, if you've never swung a light tube before, I guess, which how many people have ever done that before in their lives? Uh, I would have thought, like, if you swing it too hard, it'll just break in your hand, you know? So it made sense to me that he was, like, kind of awkward with it at first. But I guess they're a little bit stronger than you think they might be. Um, but, yeah, I, I so the, a couple of things about this match. First, not just not just about this match, but I I... I over the last couple of days, I kind of have been realizing, or at least over the over the weekend, as I was watching things unfold with with this show, I I kind of came to this like sort of realization that like, you know, Nick Gage is definitely largely popular because you know he's been doing this deathmatch stuff for like almost twenty years now. He's you know a legit like you know he's like you know, he robbed a bank and, you know, there's this whole, like everything that they talked about in his dark side of the ring, you know, he, he lives this gimmick basically. But I also was kind of noticing like he legitimately has like really great charisma and presence in the ring. He's really great on the mic. He like knows how to play up the drama. He did an amazing job. Like, if you watch the video pack, she did an amazing job of just putting over this whole storyline all along the way. And, you know, it's it's sort of, you know, I sort of was realizing, like, he's not just wildly popular because he's a criminal or a deathmatch icon. Like, he's legit a great performer with a really great, like, visceral look. He has that, like, weird snaggle tooth or, like, chip tooth or whatever that is. And he, like, really just lives the gimmick, and it's, like, really real, and, like, but he definitely, he, he knows how to act. He knows how to perform, and I was really impressed with that. And one thing we've, we've blown over that, you know, part of, the, part of the, the great things they were able to do in the build of this match is, you know, four day, three, four days before this match, Nick Gage appeared on AEW Dynamite um, and challenged and is going to be, was going to be the third labor of Jericho Mm -hmm. um, in MJF and Jericho's feud. So, you know, that's, that's AEW giving GCW a huge rub to put one of their, their stars on TV on Wednesday when they have a pay-per-view on Saturday. And I think that's definitely got to be a factor for why they ended up trending number one yeah that's yeah. Saturday against UFC the fact that like you know not just the fact that he was put on TV like at at the show like the dynamite right before this show but also the fact that he was going to be fighting Jericho and like you know I wonder how many people like might have been tuning in just to see if Jericho would like make an appearance, you know, and they actually was a tease. I, you know, I freaked out thinking that it was real and that, but they played Jericho's music and this sort of like decoy ran down to the ring and got beaten up by, uh, by Nick Gage. But that was really cool. Um, But also, you know, we've been talking about a lot of other stuff, but the, the I think the centerpiece to this match was really Matt Cardona's performance. He was so masterful, like, just like, you know, the way that he was selling it, like, he, was, he looked like he was legit, like, having an existential crisis in this match. He was even crying at one point. 
and it was it was so beautiful, so well done. Yeah, I feel like anybody at WWE who sees Matt Cardona in this match must be just kicking themselves seriously that they didn't use him better because he's got all the storytelling chops that you need to have a great match. And he was just so great. He was like so pathetic mm-hmm. when he had to be in this match. And then he was just as, you know, ruthless and mean when he had to be uh, further in the match. And, you know, watching him acclimate into the deathmatch violence and get over the trauma of being just torn apart in this ring. And, you know, being pinned in glass and having to kick out from being pinned in glass just, like, you know, seemed like that took an effort out of him. Yeah. And it was just badass. Like, it should win uh, an award for, for I don't know if there's, like, people give Best Match of the Year awards, <laughs> but there should be, like, an award for, like, Best Single Wrestler performance in a match you know what i mean yeah, yeah for sure um yeah between that uh, between matt i almost called him zach Ryder. uh between matt cardona's performance in this match and uh smart mark sterling's performance the next night uh there was some great great acting to go around for sure um i also i really thought it was such a smart decision to interject with 440 and uh Ricky Shane Page in the middle of this match to sort of like like in like mid match they sort of already are beginning the pivot towards the next uh feud and it was so smart to sort of put that into the match where you know people this is what people came here to see there's all these new people watching interject this sort of storytelling with all with this group of guys who are part of the the full-time roster and sort of move right on forward and you know keep keep the thing going it's it's the classic sort of uh i think it was the um Rick Flair versus um I think it was Rick Flair and and Rick Steamboat in one of their many classic matches uh where like right after the match Terry Funk attacks uh Rick Flair and they jump right into the next feud and I've always loved that that thing that they do sometimes where they will just like end one feud and like immediately begin the next one like when uh when Sami Zayn finally won the NXT title immediately gets attacked by Kevin Owens and starts the next feud and it was like super super well done so i really enjoyed that and this was to me this was the best match of the night um yeah i'd agree just you know like Nick Gage is the Hulk Hogan of deathmatch wrestling. And this crowd was like so hot for this match, like in a way that I haven't seen in in years. I'll say this about the GCW crowd. For the most part, they really seem to understand what their role is in all of this. Like they know that the, 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 the audience is as much a character in the show of a wrestling show as anything else. And they, you know, they have a certain role to play in, you know, booing the people that are supposed to boo and cheering the people that are supposed to cheer. And I feel like GCW fans seem to be very cognizant of the role that they're meant to play in whatever's happening. Yeah. There's a guy dressed as a hot dog. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best of all worlds. It is. Um, and fuck Dave Meltzer. So <laughs> yeah, that was that was the next night for sure. Um, so the unexpected, the unthinkable of unthinkable happens. 
Matt Cardona actually beats Nick Gage. With help. With a little help, but no, he beats him clean. Come on. He put him down, gave him his finisher. Nick Gage well, took the finisher. Ricky Shane Page, like, kicked him in the dick first. So, you know, it wasn't exactly clean. But, yeah, he, he hit him with light tubes. He did his finish. He did and... finish the radio silence. One, two, three. And took him out one, two, three. And the crowd went insane. The that clip of him winning and the crowd throwing things at him and him, you know, ducking and celebrating. Um, you know, went super, super viral. Yes. Uh for good reason. And, you know, is just an indelible moment now etched into wrestling history absolutely yes that's a great image that i think will hopefully be used more and more going forward because it's it's such a great such a great image um and you know of course dave Meltzer had his little old man stuff to say about it and like he's not wrong to a certain extent like you know you, it's, it's anything that you throw at a wrestler in the ring could be dangerous on some level. Um, but to me, like, first of all, I think, I think these guys, like, not only did they expect this, but I think they were specifically aiming for this reaction. Like they wanted people to throw things at them, you know, like, the that that and the the fact that that Matt Cardona won with help from RSP and 440 just it like adds insult to injury in such a way that they clearly were cultivating this reaction and this is kind of what they signed up for they all went into this knowing that they were going to get pelted with garbage at the end of the night and you know no one got hurt so you know let's just enjoy the moment yeah ultimately for all this talk of them trying to injure matt cardona or putting him at risk he was able to leave the ring perfectly fine of his own accord you know relatively safely you know he made it through the crowd um I just feel like, you know, you have people beating each other with light tubes and seeing all this great right. stuff. The l line that you have with the audience at that point starts to get blurred, especially when, like, you're jumping on the wrestler when he's entering the ring already. You know what I mean? Like, they're already and there's no bending the line with the audience so much. Yeah, when, when you don't have guardrails, I mean, that's like, you know, it's it's like a punk rock show. There's no division, pretty much, between the wrestlers and the fans. And so, you know, that's that's the, the crowd that they've cultivated, and I think they've, you know, purposely cultivated that. And I think it's cool, you know, to have that that much of a, that so, so little division between the wrestlers, and the it is very punk rock in a way. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that's going to happen. And they know that. And they that's what they kind of signed up for, in my opinion. So, you know, it, it was what it was. And it was a lot of fun. And it was a great image. So, you know, it was great. Um, yeah. The one thing we didn't mention was, you know, how over the pizza cutter is. Like, people have, like, cardboard pizza cutters that they made to bring to the show. Okay and watch you know the the pizza cutter spot with cardona and nick gage was you know one of the the biggest spots of of the night and you know that that to me seems like you know nick cage's hogan leg drop like that's his mm -hmm. right yeah that's his gimmick yeah for sure um i was also reading uh there was i saw a, t a, a twitter take that I thought was really, really smart, which was that um, whoever takes the belt off of Cardona is going to be like a made man in GCW. And for that reason, 
they were saying it probably shouldn't be Nick Gage mm. that gets the win back because he doesn't need, you know, he's the most over, like, I don't, I don't think there's a wrestler alive who is as over within his promotion as Nick Gage is in in, in GCW. Like, he is a king among men, and he doesn't need that rub of being the guy to, to vanquish the, the invader who's stolen the title. Um, I think it would be really cool to give that to, like, a hot up-and-comer. Um, you know, we, we both are probably not familiar enough with GCW to be able to speculate on who that might be. But perhaps we can do it anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like I, from what I saw, um, you know, maybe like I don't know if Alex Colon is a up and coming guy, but he's definitely you know he he was the ultra violent champion. He lost that belt on this show. Um, he could be a guy. I think he's part of team uh team MDK from from the next night when they set up the war games match. Um so he could definitely be a guy, you know, uh from a from a biased subjective standpoint, I think we both would be interested in seeing a guy like like you know uh Dante Leon or Ninja Mac. You know, they seem they seem more like maybe mid card type of guys, but in an indie promotion, you know, those lines are much thinner than they are in uh, much less defined. You know, a guy can, can come up really fast sometimes. So I would love to see, you know, if, there's a lot of guys who I would love to see take the title. Jim be cool. Uh, you know, even Parker would be really cool. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys I think that would that would be really cool to to take that to to take that mantle. I hope Cardona has you know a good amount of title run with this title. Me too. I'd like to see him like maybe get six months or more uh, of time milking it for a little bit, and you know I, I want to see him earn a couple more you know deathmatch stripes. As champion, I think that would be good for him. I think that'd be smart. Yeah, I think for sure, at the very least, I think he should get uh, that Nick Nick Gage should get a rematch that he loses, you know, and really kind of put over and that and really give Cardona heat, you know, to have him beat Nick Gage twice, and then he gets to go around telling people. That he beat Nick Gage twice, and then maybe like after he goes on his title run, and then ends up losing to somebody who who needs the rub a little more. Maybe then you can get Nick Gage his win back and have they do like a cage match or something where nobody can interfere, and it's you know there's nowhere for for Cardona to hide basically. Out of nowhere, Marco Stunt beats Matt Cardona for the championship. That would be imagine on like on like AEW Dark or something like that, <laughs> or into Dynamite or you know or Rampage even. The Forbidden Door. Yeah, man. If only. Uh, you want to go into night two in in a more you know lightning fashion? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, because uh, I I. Obviously, Steven didn't see, like, I think it was the first half of, of the show. Um, and I did. So I'll, I'll just, like, quickly go through, like, the first match, I didn't even see most of it. Uh, Jordan Oliver versus Jack Cartwheel, um, which were two guys from the scramble on night one. And I missed most of it because I did not realize that night two was a matinee. It started at 5 p.m. with the sun still in the sky and a much smaller crowd also, which is, you know, fairly predictable. It definitely had the feel of a little bit more of like a post show in a way. Yeah. Uh, 
because the crowd was smaller. It was, you know, during the day and it was, you know, but, you know, once we got into later into the show, it, it started to have the feel of night one a little bit more. Um, the second match was really good. It was Jonathan Gresham versus Starboy, Starboy Charlie. Who Starboy Charlie, poor guy, he went 0-2 for the weekend. Um, Jonathan Gresham is actually apparently like an old school ROH guy to a friend of mine who is a big time ROH mark. Um, it was a really cool, another one of these really cool like styles clash matches where Gresham is sort of this like big bruiser, but like very technical wrestler. And Charlie is, of course, a, you know, very small, quick, flippy guy. And it was cool seeing them sort of, you know, go back and forth uh, wrestling the match in their style. And I really love the finish also, which was, um, I don't know if you know, like when, when, I, when a guy does a figure four, sometimes the, the, the other guy will like turn it over to reverse it. Yeah. So what Gresham did is he did that, he turned it over, and then he like wrenched back on it, like propped himself up with his hands and like wrenched back. And I thought that was such a like creative cool way to and that was the finish like he he tapped him out with with that which was really really cool whoa um I submitted yeah it was it, it was definitely like creative and i'm i'm i i i, I kind of want to go back and watch some like old jonathan gresham did i say jason gresham before i think i might have it's jonathan gresham um and also, like, would love to see more of him in GCW as well. He he, he was he's very cool, very big and killer, but like technically sound, which is a cool sort of hybrid of of stuff that I really enjoyed. Um, nope. The the next match was Second Gear Crew, fresh off of winning their the tag titles in a very violent match on night one. Defended those titles on night two with against the tag team of Ninja Mac and Dante Leone, which was really cool. Another another one of these matches that was very was like a very styles clash because SGC sort of dominated most of the match with their like their very like violent sort of deathmatch oriented style. And then Ninja Mac and Dante Leon sort of got to have uh, a little hope spot toward the end where they kind of got to get in some of their flippy offense. Um, but ultimately, SGC successfully defended their titles. I think SGC are really good, really fitting tag champs for GCW. They're very well suited. They have that look, especially Mance Warner really has that look that's very, very GC, GCW, very, like, crazy guy, uh, hardcore, old school sort of sort of guys. Totally. Uh, next up was Chris Dickinson facing off against Cesar Bononi, which is very cool. AEW's uh, own, the wingman's Cesar Bononi. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. He was he really got to like do more of uh like a uh you know big monster guy kind of stuff, which he doesn't really like he he can't really do a lot of that in AEW because there's so many of those guys in AEW that he sort of had to find a little bit more of a niche as a comedy sort of guy. Um <clears throat> But in this match, he really got to play like the big, you know, beast heel guy. He was he's like an outsider. So the crowd was kind of booing him. It was another one of those uh, instances of them kind of knowing their role in all of this. Um, and Chris Dickinson is very much like a homegrown fan favorite. And so the 
the the clash of those those two things is really really cool to see um i i would love to see more of cesar bononi doing this kind of thing in aew at some point i think there could be some really cool matchups for him as like a big monster guy against some of the other monster guys in aew and i was also really impressed that cesar did the job he <clears throat> he put over the the homegrown fan favorite a uh, very menchy thing to do and the the announced team was actually talking about that uh cesar said he wanted to do more indie shows and that's part of why he was there and i think if his plan is to like go around and like put guys over in this fashion then that's a really cool thing for him to do and uh i i definitely give him props for that whoa yeah so that was that was a cool that was a fun thing and chris dickinson actually like after the match got on the mic and you know talked about like this guy is a really amazing athlete and the crowd got the crowd to cheer him a little bit so it was a really cool thing wow and he was so he's he's the second AEW talent we've seen so far on the card yes yeah right i think yeah yeah, Marco and not him. Marco and yeah, I guess like Matt Cardona doesn't really count because he was never signed. So yeah, I guess so. And interesting you say that because the next match was Joey Janela facing off against Atticus Kogar, who was another oh. another one of these really cool guys from the from the scramble the night before. And uh <clears throat> They were apparently feuding over, I think Atticus like like punched one of the guys from Rock and Roll Express or something like that, and Joey Janela kind of like was defending his honor. I don't know what exactly happened there. Like the announced team didn't really explain it that well, mm-hmm. but something happened where the Rock and Roll Express was somewhere, and Atticus like you know, disrespected them and, you know, you know, hit one of them or did something to one of them and Joey Janello kind of defending his honor. And wow, was this match fucking out of control. I, I honestly don't even remember a lot of specifics. I just remember that it was so, so violent. I do remember one thing was that they actually like set up the, the like a pane of glass between two chairs and and a ladder and then Joey i think put Atticus under or maybe it was I, maybe it was Atticus that did this to Joey i can't remember which is which but one of them like jumped and did a foot stomp through the glass onto the guy and it looked super painful and super intense. Uh, so this match was was a lot. It was it was probably like I was I was I felt like it felt like this was like even more out of control than the death matches from the night before. Well, Janela lost. Janela picked up the win. He defended the honor oh, okay. of of Ricky Morton, apparently. Whoa. Um, and he got a great crowd reaction on his entrance too. People love him. He's oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's a W favorite. He's definitely a GCW original fan favorite for sure. So they were they were very happy to see him. And also he got I think he got attacked by like four four zero after the match, and Marco Stunt ended up coming out to make the save. Whoa! So, so you know Joey Janela to Lucha Express confirmed. <laughs> um next up was this KTB and Shane Mercer versus Braden Lee and Cole Radrick. I don't remember if you had already gotten to my house by that point. I don't think so. I don't I don't really remember this match much at all. 
Um, even Shane Mercer, who I really enjoyed the night before, like didn't really make as much of an impression in this match. Um, so yeah, I don't really have that much to say about it. Um, maybe eventually I could go back and watch it again, but yeah, it didn't really make much of an impression. And they can't all sear into the memory. <laughs> exactly. Right. And there was a lot of matches this weekend and it was a lot of really good matches. So certainly something's going to sort of fall by the wayside. Um, the next match was Calvin Tankman, which I think you were there for. Yeah, I got here for this one. Uh, versus Ruckus, which was a really cool, fun, like, hoss fight type of match uh, that I really enjoyed. Also, again, didn't, didn't remember that much about it, but I remember that liking it. I also remember being annoyed that his name was Tankman and not Tankman. Why wouldn't you call a wrestler Tankman? That's like, that's the move right there. And then just be a tank and roll everyone over. Come on. Yeah, right, exactly. He looks like a tank. Yeah, it was a good match. It was, you know, fun, hard-hitting match from what you expect from someone named Tankman. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, right. And then we have basically the main event, which was Penelope Ford, another GCW original fan favorite. And now, AEW superstar. Now on to AEW. And I, I, was, I was pretty excited for this. It was, okay, so let me just say Penelope Ford versus Ali Catch who we saw the night before and were very enamored with, I think I, it's safe to say. Um, but Penelope Ford is somebody who, uh, for most of the time she's been in AEW, hasn't really grabbed my attention. And then the last couple weeks or months, her wrestle a couple times has been really impressed. And so I was really looking forward to this match. and. For me, this was probably the match of the night, of night two. Uh, it was a really, really good match. Uh, Ali is tough as nails, and Penelope was great, and they they worked together really well. Um, unfortunately, the finish didn't go as planned, and they uh, they had a shelf that they were trying to put each other through that didn't break, and I kind of felt like they were sort of going about it all wrong because everything they were doing, like they weren't falling from very high onto the thing. And like, they, they should have been like coming off of the top rope with like both of them going through it at the same time, because mm -hmm. you need a lot of weight to go through, you know, that's thick wood. That's, this isn't a table. <clears throat> so it, you know, it, it, and, but they, they, they really made lemonade out of it in a really cool way where they both kind of banded together to turn on the shelf and, like, kick it and try to get it to break, which was pretty funny. Yeah, it's interesting that this was the only women's match on either night, but they put it as the main event of the second night. So I think that that's pretty cool. Yeah, because I think Penelope Ford's a pretty big deal. Like the fact that she was coming, you know, they call it homecoming. That's part of the thing. So I think that was a big part of why that was the main event. Because I think she's like a pretty big, she seemed like she was very, a very big deal to the fans there. So that was really cool. And it was a fun match. It was really good. I'd, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see more of this GCW women's division. I would too. Yeah, I don't know how you know big their women's division is. If they're you know running a two night show and there's one women's match on it, but Penelope looked great as she has for a while, and uh, Ali Catch looked really good too. And I would definitely be into seeing more of both of them in GCW. Totally. Wait, wait. I'm an idiot. That wasn't the main event. The women were not the main event, sadly. Uh, oh, 
completely forgot about the insane um ultra violent title match between drew parker and jimmy lloyd with That's right the insanity of drew parker and jimmy lloyd who featuring us two back-to-back death matches yes yeah i know right i was like i remember when uh when uh the Drew, Drew Parker's night one match was over. I was like, this guy has to wrestle again tomorrow. I was like, oh my God. And like w- went all out again. Like so crazy. He retained, right? Yeah, he retained. He retained the title. Um, and he's going to take the title back to Japan, apparently. I guess so, yeah. Because he's got the, what is it? The, the BJW? BJ- BJ- W, I think, yeah, BJW um, title. So, yeah, he's going to take it back. Um, this match was, like, I feel like for for me, you know, this being my first time ever watching any death matches and seeing, I think it was, like, four in one weekend, like, it all kind of jumbles together in a way. It's just, like, this, like, blur of, like, ultra violence and insanity with the exception, of course, of Jimmy Lloyd bringing a syringe to the ring and using it to pierce through the nostril of Drew Parker. And then the, the best part to me was when he like got done doing this grotesque, like super cringe fucking like putting the syringe through his nostril then he like squirts what i assume is water that was in the syringe and like it just like enhances the effect so much i could not stop laughing when he did that yeah if it wasn't so ridiculously violent it almost has like the showmanship that you'd see in wwe it's it's almost like a comedy spot. If it wasn't so like excruciating to watch, it would be a comedy spot. And I still laughed because I'm like desensitized, I guess, at this point. But yeah, you stuck it in his nostril, it stuck it in his ear a little bit. Um, the other thing about that is like considering the other shit they did, that was probably one of the least painful things <laughs> that happened in that whole match. Like they're like falling in glass. Like it's just, it just looks so much more visceral and evocative because you're like, what? It's a slow, like sticking it through the skin and stuff. But like syringes are really sharp. So like that probably didn't hurt nearly as much as glass just like shredding your back, you know? Especially after doing it the night before and then doing it again. It's just the 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 horrible connotation of like you know syringes and needles that we have in our society that just makes it all that more icky. Yeah. And the other factor here too is uh, you know Matt Cardona said in in interviews after the match, like when you go backstage at GCW, there is no medical team. Okay. There's no like ambulance waiting to take you away. Wow. There's no medical team. There's one nurse and she's doing stitches for people. Wow. And that's about it. They're just cleaning wounds and stitching wounds. Yeah. That makes that kind yeah. of perspective the people that were like criticizing him for for tending his wounds in his hotel room and like getting blood everywhere and you know, bloodborne illness that they're exposing the staff to and stuff like that. Like if there if there's no there's one nurse backstage at a a show where people like like multiple people are going through glass like multiple times that seems like i mean i guess that's what they can afford but that's that seems like an important investment to make yeah but it's part of the mystique too of how how you know insane this Thing you're participating in is is that you know there's the safety net is is not there um the yeah. other interesting thing that matt cardona said uh he did an interview with uh oral sessions um the renee paquette podcast and he said that when he got you know the big gouge in his arm that mm. he didn't know how bad it was and that the ref 
was telling him that it's really, really bad. Does he want to stop? Oh, and wow. when he, when the ref is telling you that you're really, really bad, you start getting like really nervous. And so that's when he had like genuine fear oh, creep wow. into him. So it was a very, very interesting, you know, interesting podcast. Did they, did, was he the one that they like taped his arm up? Or like, there were a couple people I remember, like, I remember one guy in sp- in particular, I can't remember who it was, but like, after the match, like, w- walked out with tape on his back that definitely wasn't there when he came to the ring. So like, they do that. Yeah, t- tape is one of their medical supplies, duct yeah. tape. <laughs> and the way that Matt Cardona got uh, well, when he left the the ring, they had to leave in a rush because the fans were trying to kill him. Right. So he ended up going to a hotel room of someone who was staying nearby and then taking a shower and trying to wash all the glass out of his wounds. Oh, my God. And then since all they had was, was hotel towels, yeah. and he still had to get on a flight, they basically wrapped his body up in different hotel towels and just duct taped all of these towels to his body so that he could travel and then as he traveled like you know it would just like congeal and harden and then he'd move and then it would rip and then it would bleed again and it was just the most hardcore yeah. of course that's and then when he got to anaheim to disneyland to celebrate he had to take a quick stop at the hotel to tend to his wounds and take a nap and, you know, have his fiance actually find him actual bandages. Right, yeah. Damn, that's, he, he truly is the king of hardcore. Whoa. The king of the death match. He had a, a great promotion yesterday on, on August 2nd where uh, anybody who bought one of his shirts from the pro wrestling tea store, he's going to give you a personal call on your cell phone. So I bought, oh, wow. That's awesome. I bought one of his shirts. So I'm, I'm awaiting my call from Matt Cardona. That's awesome. So, but there was yeah, still a little more of the show that we still need to talk about. Yeah. For sure. And overall, the, the homecoming uh, presentation, I think, definitely turned us into GCW fans. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was a fan at the end of night one and like, like I said before, I, I ended up having to eat the cost of getting night two separately because I wanted to see what was going to happen next and was not disappointed. And now the end of the show, the end of the show, this, I hesitate to say that this was my favorite part of the entire weekend. But so I was I was actually and I was saying pretty much the whole day I was I was saying to to various people that I felt like it would have it would make sense for them to close with something a little bit more story based mm-hmm. and more m- mainly because that was kind of what I was hoping to see as someone who has been sort of made a fan you know, in one night of this promotion and the thing that would, that I knew would get me wanting to see more would be to end the night with, you know, the fallout from the Nick Gage 440 stuff. And they, they did, they booked it. They, this whole thing was booked perfectly. And Bra fucking vo to Smart Mark Sterling for an absolute masterpiece performance. It was just every piece of what he did was so well done. He comes out from behind the curtain and tells everyone to keep six feet of distance and then pulls out his mask and puts it on and walks through the crowd. And, and then he gets annoyed that they don't have steps for him. And he's like, where are the steps? How do you get in the ring? <laughs> and that the ring isn't clean enough. Can we clean the ring one more time? Because this ring still isn't clean enough. I'd really appreciate it. And then he's, he's glass. Out there cleaning the ring. 
he's like very thankful to the people cleaning the ring. It's like great. Yeah, and then gets in the ring and starts talking about how he and Matt are uh, ideas. And like, for instance, what if we rename the title to the GCW Universal Championship, which is just like gets a rain of booze. It was just such a such a great. And then goes on to and then somebody throws a bottle at him an empty bottle and he's like who threw that who threw that and then he it, it's a perfect segue into him being like you know what i agree with dave Meltzer, which of course also gets a rain of booze that you know people shouldn't be throwing stuff in the ring you know it's it's a total embarrassment it's dangerous blah 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 and then reveals that he and Matt Cardona will be filing a class action lawsuit against the GCW universe. So against the fans. And it was just, oh, it was so, so good. And which, of course, that brought out Nick Gage, who came to the ring. And, you know, Smart Mark Sterling is, you know, kind of saying like, Oh, don't you, don't you can't touch me. You can't touch me. I'll sue you. I'll sue your ass. And so he punches him in the face. <laughs> of course. Wait, wait. Before he reads the official statement from Matt Cardona to the GCW universe. Oh, that's right. That he's been holding up so high that he has an official written statement to read. Right. From Matt Cardona to the GCW universe. And the written statement is just, fuck you. I forgot about that. That's right. That was that was great. End statement. <laughs> End statement. That was the best. Oh my god. Um. So of course, so so Nick Gage comes out. He's about to. He's brandishing the pizza cutter, about to slice up the face of of Smart Mark Sterling, and then you know. Ricky Shane Page and Atticus shows up and the rest of 440 shows up. And so I think I think Nick Gage like grabbed a chair and basically was, you know, preparing himself to like take on, you know, five guys. And so you're and the way, you know, they they're 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 doing that thing, right? Where they stand there for a minute waiting and you can tell like okay somebody's gonna come out now so what's who, who's it gonna be what's going on you're like is jericho gonna come out is like who you know what what do they have in store and it was nothing that fancy it was very simple you know i think i think it was alex cologne that came out first right do you remember or? i don't know i couldn't tell you the order i know it was alex cologne alex cologne and then uh, SGC came out, Second Gear Crew. Uh, to the I, I, oh, I also forgot to mention that they have one of my favorite uh, entrance themes, which is uh, Walk by Pantera, which actually used to be RVD's music in ECW. And the first time I heard it, I was like, holy shit, is RVD here? <laughs> you know, like. Did he, did he show up late for the uh, the Grim Reefer match? Um, but and also I really love the fact that uh, Nick Gage's entrance music is "For Whom the Bell Tolls" by Metallica. That's a really cool entrance theme. Totally. Um, so Mark Cologne shows up, and then SGC shows up, and then I think like Effie and maybe Allie was there with him. Or it seemed like like it, at that point it seemed like like almost everybody was coming out, but I think the five that were the main five were you know Gage of course and Cologne and SGC and Effie, and they all came in for backup, and then they had you know the the very you know typical standoff followed by just like going to war with each other which was a really, really fun, effective spot. And it all set up 
to introduce to to announce that during the Second City Summit in Chicago, where GCW is going to be running a show called The Art of War on the, the night before All Out on September 4th, uh, they announced that there will be a War Games match Whoa. between these two teams. So now the, 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 the event has been renamed to The Art of War Games, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. I am definitely going to be tuning in the night before uh, All Out to see to see the Art of War games, and I'm really excited about it. And the crazy thing is, is that if hypothetically, you know, they're going to have also a world championship match on that card, they've just, you know, they've just taken like 10 people potentially off of that world title yeah. match off the table yeah so off so we might it would be interesting it, i think it'll be really interesting to see who matt cardona might end up choosing he might even not like you know he the, the, he's suing the gcw universe right like he might even just like you know get heat by not defending the title at all but i think also a great move for him to do would be to like select like an inferior sort of opponent like you know like give starboy charlie a shot at the at the gcw title or something like that and have him like nearly lose right because he underestimates starboy charlie or whoever it might be dante leone i don't know uh but to have him sort of you know, defend the title against like a mid Carter that he doesn't think has any chance, and for him to like almost lose that match too, would be would be a really cool way to do it. That would be awesome. I'd be down for that. Yeah, I think that'd be. I, I think Starboy Charlie actually, like the more I'm thinking about it, would be a really good. You know, that would be the perfect. Like, there's no way this guy can beat me. He's half my size, and then you know, have Starboy Charlie do his thing and you know, come this close to, to beating him would be a really cool moment. Well, anything else to add or before I close this puppy out? Just, you know, again, reiterate like this, this, this show made me a fan. This was, you know, this was like, this is, I, I can't remember another show like this since, uh, Jericho and Omega fought at Wrestle Kingdom that was bringing in so many new people to to a promotion and that made that I I can only assume made a lot of people new fans because I think I think most people never expected that GCW had such a such a diversity of stuff going on in that promotion you kind of think of it as this deathmatch promotion but they have so much other stuff going on and I'm really excited to, to watch more GCW. They actually have a show tomorrow that I'm probably not going to buy because it's $12 and I don't even know what the card is, but you know, they run shows, you know, that's another thing about the, 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 the sort of indie um, pay-per-view format, like indie uh, promotions they just run shows every, you know, couple weeks, every month. They, you know, they have time to sort of build stuff up and they also don't have to be beholden to linear storytelling as much, but they, they still are able to, to get it in there. I think also with, uh, with IWTV, uh, independent wrestling TV, which is a, a monthly subscription service. I think it's like 10 bucks a month and you get like more independent wrestling than one person could ever possibly watch. I mean, there's so many, there was a show just, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before Preston Vance had a match for, he, I think he's like the new South wrestling champion or, Oh yeah. Or maybe he was going for the championship. I it, it wasn't really clear. 
but he was like in the main event of a of an indie show uh that was on that's on IWTV every week so i'm i'm actually really seriously considering getting a subscription to that and see if there's you know other independent promotions that i might be might get really excited about whoa that sounds awesome yeah it's a cool time like to be able to you know to have this thing where you know not just the people who live in such and such city have access to all these independent wrestling promotions now they're able to have their own like subscription service that shows all of them or a lot of them at least i think defy is on there too which is one that i really like because i i got to see them a couple times when i was living in portland and got to see swerve you know isaiah swerve scott now on nxt darby allen that's the first time i saw darby allen was in defy and he really impressed me on in defy so it's really cool to to have independent wrestling you know have be out there so much and have so much access to it nowadays it's really cool it's an exciting time to be a wrestling fan it's an exciting time to be a zach Ryder fan definitely <laughs> definitely um make sure to follow us on itunes or stitcher or google play check us out on youtube by looking for vundacast productions to see all the cool things we're doing um i have been your host steven and i have been your non-binary ultra-violent champion d rock tweet us at vundacast and remember, kids, take care and spike your hair. Woo, woo, woo. You know it. Hey, Wunder. Hey, Wunder. Wundercast? Give yeah. it up for Wundercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Wundercast. What's up, everybody? This is JC David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Boondocast. Look out! to the Vondacast.